So how does the J-pole work anyway? Got one here. What do all the different parts do? And doesn't it seem strange right here where these things are so close together? Doesn't that just short out the RF? Let's find out. Welcome to Ask Dave, episode 36. I'm Dave Kassler, KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. I've been asked, how does the J-Pole work anyway? It seems so long and unwieldy and it's got this weird section right here, usually called a J because people look at it this way. And then the coax is attached way down here right where it's just shorted a couple inches later. How does it work? Well, let's divide the J-pole into three parts. We'll take this part up here and I'm gonna put a piece of masking tape around it so we can recognize that this part over here is separate from this. And then I'm gonna put another piece of masking tape right here to show that this part is separate. So let's start with the easy part, the part down here at the bottom. This is what you connect the antenna with. It has no electrical effect on the antenna. It's a nice thing to run a wire to ground though to bleed off the static charges that come from the wind. So we can ignore this part. Now let's go over to the top part, over here, right here. This is a two meter J pole, and this piece right here is a half wavelength dipole, okay? It's a half of a wavelength. So we're on two meters, so this is on the order of a meter long. Well, now don't we normally feed dipoles in the middle? We sure do, right about there. And the reason we feed them right about there is because if you break that and put one side on each on the coax, it's uh, going to be about 50 ohm match. Be very nice, but uh, that's not how we're doing it in this antenna. The problem with impedance is as you go further away from the center, the impedance goes up and up and up because although you can flow uh, current in the middle, when you get the end, there's no place for the current to go. So it turns out that the voltage goes up on either end like this and the current goes down all the way down and then the current goes down so here's the deal the impedance at the ends is theoretically infinite now in actual practice it's only several thousand ohms okay so when you end feed a dipole you have a real problem because you're feeding it at its highest impedance point now we get to the magic part okay if we look at just this part of the dipole what do you see well, what I want you to see is two very thick wires, okay? We're only interested in the skin effect, so they don't have to be uh, uh, very thick. It's just that there's two wires, and they are right next to each other, okay? And if you were to extend that in either direction, what you would have is essentially an open wire transmission line. Now there's a formula for figuring out the characteristic impedance of transmission line that looks like this, and it turns out it's about a 500 ohm line. Well, that doesn't really matter because we're not using it for that. We're using a magic property of transmission lines, the quarter wavelength. Whatever the impedance is here, at the end of a quarter wavelength, it'll be the opposite. So if it's really low here, it'll be really high here. This only works on one design frequency, only on one band, two meters in this case, okay? So this piece of transmission line comes in at zero ohms because it's shorted right here at the end, right? And it's, in theory, infinite at the other end. Look at that, right there, it's infinite. Well, now isn't that interesting? Because we need infinite or very high impedance to drive the end of a dipole. So this part is the antenna and this part transforms zero ohms to very, very high impedance and drives the very, very high impedance dipole here. Match made in heaven, so to speak. Now, where do we feed an antenna like that? Well, we've got this balanced transmission line, okay? And so the impedance is extremely high here and it's zero here. So the question is, where in the middle 
is 50 ohms. Well, I'll tell you where it is. It's only a little bit up from the end. Yeah, that's right. The impedance is zero here. It's about 50 here. You know, you can go on up to 100, 200, 500, 800, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 ohms, but it's really close to this end that it's 50 ohms. And so that's where we feed it, right there where the impedance is 50 ohms. Kind of funny, huh? So at RF, we're dealing with something that's a nice match, even though physically it looks like good grief, it's shorted only right there. It's 50 ohms away because it goes up really high over here. Okay, very good, but there's a problem, you say. I just said that that was a balanced transmission line, and it is, okay? But we're feeding it with coax. Well, that's feeding a balanced line with an unbalanced coax. Is there a problem here? Yes, there is. Now, a lot of people just feed it direct with coax, but a nice thing that you can do is take some coax, about 10 feet or so, and just loop it up, kind of make a little roll like this, and then have that kind of hanging down right here, okay, right in this area, and then the coax coming up to here, and that little coil of, of coax acts as a choke ballon so on this end, it's a balanced feed, and then as the coax comes out the end, it's unbalanced and goes down to your, trans your uh, transceiver. Now, when you go out to test this thing with your antenna analyzer, make sure you get it way up in the air, okay? And put your line and your little coil right here and run it down to where your meter is below you and get this thing up above your head and do the checking and tweaking then. So. You might have to move this up or down a little bit to get the right match. Tune it for the frequency you use the most, and it'll be pretty good on the rest of the band. There you have it. This is how antennas work. So I'm going to try out a new feature of YouTube here where they put end cards, and we'll see how they work. If they don't, please subscribe. I've got a link down below, or you can click right on the video to subscribe. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.